And we'd like to welcome everybody back to the Football's Family Podcast. And it's been a, a tradition here on in May for me to do things like this. This is Mental Health Awareness Month. And especially now that two years ago, uh, May 25th, uh, my son committed suicide as a battle. He battled his demons. And I hate to say it, the demons didn't win. The demons will never win. But they were victorious at that point. Uh, they didn't win ultimately. Uh, so I like to honor his memory, and I've got a couple guys on here to help me do that today. Would y'all like to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm uh, Ben Hayes. I am a licensed professional counselor in Muscle Shoals, Alabama, and I also work as a minister at the Highland Park Church of Christ. Um, I've got five kids of my own, and I'm cousin to the other guy who is on the show today with us, Travis Creasy. Yeah, I'm Travis Creasy. I've been on a couple of times. I co-host the Helping Healing Humor with Ben and Travis podcast. Uh, and I like to joke that I'm his, his his guinea pig in the mental health thing. That's not really how it works, but I do get free counseling weekly. So, hey, I'll take it. Oh, uh, yeah, guinea pig. So as long as he doesn't say, go up there and touch that light switch and tell me if it shocks you, that's where I'm saying, no, I'm not going to do that yeah. sort of stuff. Yeah. We were, we, we've all were under, uh, we dodged a bullet. We missed services tonight. We dodged a bullet with the weather. It's still not done yet, but it's not as bad as I thought it would be, but y'all had some problems down there, didn't you? Yeah, we were, uh, I live about a mile from the airport, you know, when, so when the news is like describing the color of the buildings around you and the names, it's like, well, we might not get under, but we spent a little time in the closet underneath the stairs, uh, but we got a really safe, really nice house for something like this. We it's uh, you know, I don't a split level. That's what's what it's called. So we were I'm seeing the light down the basement. Seeing the lightning in the background there, dude. <laughs> oh yeah, that's still lightning. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, it's it's like that's why you have kids, Ben, so you can put them on top while you're in the bottom. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know what animal it is that actually Daddy. throws their young at the bad guys that are trying to eat them to save its life. I'm like, that's living the dream right there. That's hilarious. <laughs> uh, I have and, and and been, you know, I, I've last few years, I have tried to tell my story a little bit, not just with Connor, but with myself. I grew up not understanding what was going on with me. And recently I've been diagnosed with uh, depression disorders, different types with post-traumatic stress because of what I saw and I think we're going to go on your show after this, and I'll explain more about that. And uh, we generalize anxiety and a lot of other things that have come along with it. Been on medicine for years. Uh, some work, some don't. I just got genetically tested that said that one that I'm on doesn't work. Yay! It's all fun. <laughs> but it, it's one of those things that got me it got me interested in mental health uh, because I think it's overlooked and under undervalued especially for men maybe it's a little different now but i know in the 80s and 90s it was you were crazy to talk about it yeah I mean, don't talk about it, especially if you're a man it's a it's it's crazy and when you did talk about it it was a weakness especially in the church where they would quote philippians 4 be anxious and nothing but in everything with prayer and supplication make your request made known to god i'm like yeah you can't be anxious yeah although you know that that word anxious does not mean what you think it means yeah Maybe it's gotten better, but the one thing that I've noticed is when more people come out talking about their struggles, like A.J. Brown a few years ago, one of my favorite Titans until he got traded, Ted Gummett still, he came out talking about his struggles. And actually, I did a show yeah. about it, and I'm like, this guy is brave, and he's not alone, you know? Yeah, it, it has for a long time. And Travis and I, you know, that's kind of why we started our podcast was to, you know, and some of the other things we do with that is to somewhat normalize the talk um, because it feels like for a long time for the church, it was very much looked down on. It was like, hey, if you got cancer or if you got a broken arm, you need to go get medicine or go get that, you know, taken care of. You're going to go to the hospital. You know, nobody's ashamed of that. Nobody's like, oh, you went and saw a doctor for your cancer. You know, I mean, like most of the time, that's not the response people have. But when you start talking about, I went to a psychiatrist who is a medical doctor that deals with mental health, you know, there was a stigma to that 
and still maybe is to a certain point, but I think that we've slowly, both in society in general and now within the church, there's a little bit more of an understanding of that. And some of those verses, like you mentioned, Philippians 4 and other places where Jesus you know, talks about not worrying in Matthew chapter 6, were, were perceived as this is a commandment. You shouldn't worry. And if you worry, you're sinning <laughs> and not, Hey, I've got this, you know, I love you and I want to take it from you. I want to help you with it. I want to, you know, God knows how our brains are wired. He knows how we work. Uh, he made them. So if anybody knows how they work, he knows, and he knows how they failed when the fall came and how all that kind of stuff happens, you know, because of, of, you know, sin coming into the world. So God understands it and God knows it. And so, yeah, we, we, we deal with it. And I think we need to talk about it more because what ends up happening is the moment you say, and I'm sure you, you know, encountered this, the moment someone says, you know, you, you're sinning by worrying or by being anxious. Well, the next thing you do is you hide it and you push it back down and you go, back to your little closet or your room and like, okay, I can't talk about this. And then that only makes the anxiety worse. It, and the it, it does. Travis, you had cancer not too long ago, right? But yeah, 2018, I was diagnosed with leukemia and uh, spent five weeks in Huntsville hospital and uh, was later basically told I was about three to five days from dying. And uh I'm glad they didn't give me that information on the front end. Uh <laughs> But yeah, yeah, leukemia, 2018, 86 treatments or so. So so you had, and they knew how to treat it for the most yes. part. They knew what it was. The thing that I've understood, and Ben, you're obviously, you're in a little bit different situation than I am. Mental health is not an exact science. No, it's, it, I mean, there, there's some some good rubrics or whatever to, to follow, but there's a lot of times I, somebody leaves my office and, and I think that's the good and the bad of diagnosis is you have to diagnose to be able to, to treat on some level and to be able to give the right medicines. But, you know, it's not like a broken arm, you know, you can do a, a, a scan and go, okay, arms broken or do a scan and go, here's cancer. Um, sometimes it's not that easy with the brain and you got to do some, you know, a lot of the right questions and figuring out kind of, you know, what, what people are struggling with. So yeah, it's a little bit, more difficult. It's a lot of talking and, and, uh, trying to, a lot of times with me dealing with, you know, what are the, the symptoms and what are the, the, the root causes of some of those things. And of course I don't do meds. Uh, I'm not a, I'm not a psychiatrist, so I can't hand out prescriptions, but you know, I, I deal with it from more the talk therapy side of it. And that's the, that's the big thing about I, I've I've talked to people here at Wildwood and other places, especially with my level of study that I'm going through at Heritage now, that has opened my eyes up to more stuff and more reading. Uh, that I found that people don't want to be talked to; they want to be taught. They want to be allowed to talk. Mm -hmm. And if you have somebody come in and you tell them how they're feeling or how they should feel, it will not work. Uh, if you've ever watched, and and I say it like this: if you ever gone to a gone to a pound, you know, you know, a, a, a clinic like that. And you go to where the dogs are and you can see the dogs that have been beaten and either they're very, very uh, timid and hide, or they're very aggressive. That's what could happen with people. If you tell them you can't feel what you're feeling, they either hide, like you're saying, or they become overly aggressive to understand it. Um, and, and it's, it's funny how the mind works like that. I, I don't, I don't know. It's, the one thing I want is to take that stigma away. I had a shirt on just a little bit ago. Uh, when my son died, I got up and I spoke. And again, I still should not have done that. That's, I just had to. And I said, we have to break the stigma. And on it, it says break the stigma. And it has the green ribbon with my son's initials. I have it on my arm right here. But the big thing, Ben and Travis, is, is I have the the semicolon. Uh, because not uh, probably just a few years before Connor, I was suicidal. And if it wasn't for the fact that I had people rally around me, uh, I don't know if I'd be here. And, and I'm reminded that 
his story is still not done. I mean, that's why I'm going to school right now. That's what I want to do with whatever I get is to continue honoring his memory that, you know, he's still here. Yeah. And if you cannot, if, if men, especially women have an easier time in a lot of ways than men do because of societal norms, I'm not saying easy, but easier, but men have been taught all the time. Your feelings don't matter or they're not what, you need to have. And if you have them, then that's a weakness that I apologize. I, one time in, in ROTC in high school, I apologized to my sergeant. I did something wrong. I said, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. And he's like, that's weakness. Don't ever apologize to somebody. And I remember that it was my sophomore year in high school, just a few years ago. I'm like, golly, you want, you said that's a weakness to me. If you can admit when you need help, that's the strength. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, there's so many. I mean, think about the 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 phrases that we've we've used. You know, you got to be strong, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You know, there, there's all those things that we tend to throw it probably at men more than we do at women sometimes. Um, you know, don't cry, don't rub it in baseball. You know, you get hit, you get hit with a base. Don't rub it. You know, I mean, that's that's always been the thing um, that that we've put out there. And so, you know, over time we have kind of built this image that you better be tough like this. And if you're not, you know, there's a problem. And, uh, you know, it, it's kind of interesting that there's, there's some, some pretty great people, biblically speaking and, and otherwise, um, who definitely weren't tough all the time. They had their, their moments where they could, they were, you know, were allowed to, to have that tender side of them. And, and sometimes our societies look down on that. Maybe even the church has at times. What do you think, Travis? Yeah, I mean, I was speaking to your point, broken arm, cancer, you know, I'm five years removed. I've had remission. I've had, I've had a great turnout. Uh, a lot of other people would desire to have. Um, and even that for me is a mental thing that I have to process. You know, why do I get to, be with my kids tonight, you know, and, and even in the midst of the storms, have to be able to cuddle up with them and pull them closer. So I think even with broken arms, uh, even with the cancer, even with all that, you know, one of the first things they did when I was diagnosed and was leaving the hospital was they gave me all these pamphlets about support groups that even down to the exact leukemia I had, you know, here's people you can reach out to the people who came and visited me. So like even doctors with, with all the medicine, you know, the, the MDs and all that stuff that, you know, the oncologists were like, Hey, we can fix this blood stuff, but you need to find people who you can help process, help you process this whole thing. And, you know, just like with your son, the process continues and there are things that I'll, you know, a certain smell or, something will happen that will trigger a memory that I haven't thought about in five years that I either buried or I was just so in and out of consciousness for the first 24 hours. And I'm like, Whoa, where'd that come from? And so I think even that, you know, for an MD and, and we know that MDs can have egos just like the rest of us, but they have to go, okay, I, this is what I focus on. This is my specialty. You need to go be with people, like-minded people, or, you know, people who've had cancer or whatever it is. And so I think even then, uh, that's such a big deal. That's a statement. And we as the church, as Christians, um, as coaches, whatever aspect we are doing in our life, we have to understand that mental health impacts every level of our being. And so there's a spiritual impact. There's a personal, relational, everything, because how you perceive starts with your eyes and it immediately goes into the brain. I won't get too technologically here, or, you know, savvy because I don't have the words like Ben probably has, but uh, you know, I, that's something I've experienced. Like everybody is going through something. And so your communication with them has to be informed by that. Even if you don't have all the details and dealing with teenagers, I teach five hours a day, teenagers. And I just try to remind myself because I'm a big kidder. Nice. Good one. <laughs> I must have hit a good point there. <laughs> <laughs> that was lightning. You got to be careful what you say, because some kids you could do that with. Yeah. And some kids may take it personally, but let, let, me, let me throw something out here and, and let's see, see what y'all think about this. Um, 
we tried everything with Connor, everything. We took him all the places and he wasn't taking his medicine. We found that out. I have, like I said, I've been taking medicine for 10 years and people say, well, that should cure you. It doesn't, it doesn't, it helps. Uh, I tell people and, and joking or not, we went to Disney world in December and they had the Mad Hatter ride. And so we're all mad here. And I'm like, yeah, if I'm not on my medicine, I would be him. <laughs> and that's a little joke, but not really. You, you have to have both medical and listening. So when people say, well, how can I help? Don't give advice. You're not qualified. And even people like you, Ben, who are, you probably, if, if, if what I think you do, you, you do, you don't give advice, you lead. Yeah, we try our best not to give advice because I don't have to live with what I tell yeah. you to do, you know. Yeah. And there's yeah, you, you you get up and you say, Well, you need to do this and this and this. Well, that might work for Ben and Travis, but that won't work for me. That's right. That's right. And yeah. if you fail at it, you're like, Oh, I just failed them. Like, you know. You what you try to do is is discover, you know, it's a kind of a mutual discovery in counseling. Um, that through what you tell me and what you value and what you enjoy and the things that you can do, then we might try to discover some tool belts, uh, some tools for the tool belt that will work for you. And I might make some suggestions of, you know, trying some different things. Um, but of course I, I make sure and tell them, I can't, I can't make you do anything that I say, but let's brainstorm together and try to, you know, work at things that you'll do. And, uh, there may be some actions that you can take and I might suggest those, but certainly don't try to give too much advice in the, in the process. Um, I, we, we found a long time ago that the greatest thing you can do as a counselor is just to establish a relationship yeah. with, with the person that you're talking with and the listening and building that rapport with them means as much as any technique that you'll ever give or ever do. It's, I'd say this, um, I think it's understood now more about getting help. I don't know if insurance covers it like it should. Um, then I, when I can say, guys, if you need help, you need help. I know that financially it is probably draining. Uh, we've, because of our situation, we have been helped out. So I can't say anything financially. I can't, I'm not going to get involved with that. But I do know that if you are unable to find that type of help, then find people that can listen. Maybe that's way above their pay grade, but just find somebody that would listen and not judge. Yeah. Um, you will find that, and Ben, you know this, and Travis, you know this too with your work with kids. A lot of the psychoses, and that's not even the right word, a lot of the mental struggles that you have doesn't isn't just something that happens. It's rooted in something in the past, and you may not even realize it. You may not even realize it. And when it comes out, you're like, oh, Mm -hmm. I had forgotten about that. So that's where you're like, well, I'm not qualified to listen to it, but you might've helped somebody who knows, but seek help. If you do seek help, if you do, you are wanted, you are needed. Uh, 988. I've worked with them a couple, couple, three times since, since Connor's death. Uh, you know, call them, uh, but don't, you know, don't expect them to help you all the way through. They'll help you to get to a point where you can get more help, but they're not going to be there the entire time. That's just not what they're there for. If you have a religious background and you are close to the preachers, the preacher may not be qualified so much like mental health, but he could, or he or she could help you get to a better part. If you have a trusted family friend or a friend, maybe they can help you. Uh, but the big thing that I want people to hear from this and I know y'all agree is just don't hold this in. It's dangerous to hold it in. Yeah, absolutely. I, I would say something that, that I've kind of learned or, you know, and I hope this comes across the right way is you're more than your diagnosis. You know, um, a lot of times people say I'm, I am bipolar or I am depressed or I am anxious. It, you, you have those things, but you're not those things, you know, you're, you're much more than that. And there's a, that's a piece of you that makes, you know, um, what you're dealing with difficult at the moment. Mm -hmm. 
but you're, you're, you're more than that. You know, there's more to you than that. It's like, I have a broken arm, but I'm not a broken arm. You know, I have cancer, but I'm not cancer. And the same thing with any mental health diagnosis. Um, there's more to you than that diagnosis. And so don't, I, I try to encourage people not to get hung up on the diagnosis, but let's work on some of those feelings and those thoughts and those things that you're facing. I think we have a few more minutes. I want to, number one, thank y'all for coming on. Um, I, in college, I took abnormal psychology and psychology at Fried Hardman. Abnormal psychology because I thought I'm going to get married one day and I need to understand my in-laws. <laughs> I can't remember who taught me in abnormal psychology, but it was, he was a neat dude. All I remember about it was that. But I did something that semester. I read the DSM-4. Bless your heart. It was not required, and I should not have done that. I should have played more Goldeneye. That's what I should have done, but I read it. <laughs> You're laughing because y'all did it too. Don't give me that grief. Don't give me that grief at all. Uh, now it's a five. Yeah, the Diagnostic and Statistical. Uh, see, can pop that up again. Manual for Mental Health. Yeah. Yeah. For mental disorders, it is not light reading to me now. Now, yes, yes. Now to nowadays, for me, light reading is well. I've got several books over here: the Killing series by Bill O'Reilly. I'm going to be ki reading Killing the Witches really There's soon. Travis talking about Travis there. I read oh, those yeah. like crazy. Killing the Killers, Travis was fantastic. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah. I have not read Killing Jesus because I think I've got another book that can tell me about that. But <laughs> the other ones, Killing Kennedy, was my favorite so far. Reagan was good too. Anyway, it's good. Uh, I read them I, all. You read them all. Which one? I you read them all. <laughs> oh, that's tough. I, I'm I'm kind of a Lincoln Abraham Lincoln guy. That oh, that was the first one, so that probably Lincoln Lincoln story. It still, it gets me that he went to Richmond. Like, what in the world are you doing there, Lincoln? <laughs> that was amazing. But by the way, you talk about mental disorder. Abraham Lincoln and his wife, Mary Todd, had several, several, Mary Todd especially, she's given a bad rap because they say she was crazy. She was not, she had her mental problems, obviously, but uh, she was not as crazy people make her out to be. They but, had plenty of reason to be. Oh, they absolutely, when you, she lost it when, uh, when, and she had every right to, I'm not knocking it, when her son died. And then once Lincoln died in her arms, well, and right next to her, he didn't die in her arms. He died on the ground with with another lady holding him. Uh, she lost it. She literally went. She just lost it for several years, in fact. And I think her own son uh, had to distance her, himself from her. It was it was tragic. But you know, you think that one guy that they considered to be one of the greatest presidents of all time had mental disorders, and you think, well, that's 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 scary. It's not. It's it's normal. You cannot tell me that if you were to do everyone, if you were to do a character study of our presidents from the beginning till now, you can't find something in there. Read it. Read about Andrew Jackson. Oh, who wrote he, he, the, the Lion of the? Oh, golly, what's the name of that book? A biography of Andrew Jackson. Fantastic, but he had traits, and he was one of the best presidents we have ever had in a lot of ways. Thomas Jefferson was a narcissist. I mean, come on, you you keep reading of these things. Yeah, desire to desire that office. I think you have to have some a few things loose. But yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. No one wakes up in the morning and say, "This is what I want to do for a living," and then say, "Oh, no, really, no, I don't." <laughs> it's a power thing. It really is. And if you don't want people who don't want that, you know. Yeah. Um, but you can't tell me that any of those any of those people. And these are guys, these are men that we put up as, as our leaders, whether you agree with them or not, you pray for them. You absolutely pray for them every day, whether you like them or not, you do that. And you think, well, they're, they're, they don't have any problems. Well, come on. Don't y'all read history books? They have all the problems. They have all the problems. <laughs> uh, and, and agree with me or not. And I'm not saying I agree with him or not, but did you watch any of the, during COVID, the daily uh, the daily interviews of Donald Trump, that dude, agree with him or not, if you look at him, you could tell he slept maybe two hours a night. It was wearing on him. Yeah. yeah. That job has a, it's hard. <laughs> and then wants oh, to do I mean, it again. 
what watch how many guys go from you know like dark hair to gray hair in four years and and you can just tell it takes a toll and there's a there's a thing Yalom, who's kind of a, a famous counselor um wrote uh in one of his books he talked about we're fellow journeyers you know and he was talking about even as a counselor uh he tries to make sure people understand hey i'm on this life journey with you just because i'm a counselor doesn't mean that i'm immune to anything or that i don't have problems too or that you know my relationships are somehow perfect and that i cope with everything travis knows he gets my text messages um you know and and so i may deal with it by you know unloading on him or other people things that that i'm struggling with but we're all fellow journeyers and so if you go hey i'm struggling in some way well welcome to the club because we're all struggling in some way and and we'll we'll finish we'll finish with this because I think we're getting to the point. Yeah, we are. Um, I don't want to follow a man or a woman who is not able to admit that he or she have struggles. If you come up to me and say, "I want to lead you," and I give well, I wouldn't even say come up and tell me that. I let you. I let you, and you say, "Well, I don't have these problems." <clears throat> I'm not following you. Because what, you know, we can, we can talk about man of sorrows. Yeah. Jesus understood that. You can read about men like Harry Truman, who understood what it's like to be a normal person, not born in wealth or anything like that. Uh, Andrew Jackson, not born in wealth. You, you, you hear about stuff like that. And then you hear about other people who have the money and you think, well, they don't understand what I do. Well, how did they get to that point? Again, if you are struggling with things, find somebody who is willing to admit that they struggle too. It, it, you talk about relationships. It's one thing that I do here at Why Wouldn't It? Y'all do where you are. Uh, people won't listen to you until they know that you are human. Mm -hmm. They just won't. And if you can't, if you get up there and say, guys, it doesn't have to be specific. <laughs> That's one thing I learned at Fried Hardman. I think, uh, oh, I can't remember who, I can see his face. One of my teachers got up there and said, you cannot be human. Don't admit when you make mistakes. Well, <laughs> I get what he's saying. You don't have to be specific about things. But don't get up and say, I don't struggle. I mean, yeah. that's why. I disagree with that wholeheartedly. Yeah. Well, you know who it is. Um, one um, of the tallest sure. preachers, I, uh, tallest <laughs> teachers I've ever had. It. <laughs> you remember exactly who it is, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that's, it's crazy because the Bible doesn't do that. It doesn't, it doesn't hide anybody's struggles. Every one of our heroes had struggles and, you know, even Jesus sweated drops as, as blood the night before he was crucified. That sounds like anxiety to me. You know, that sounds like he was pretty stressed out about what was happening the next day. Oh, well, so, yeah, Elijah, know. why did he run and get up in the mountains? Yeah, uh, you know Peter. Why did he? Why did he sink? You can't tell me that. And you say, well, Christians or, or believers. If you're if you're not a Christian, you're a believer in something else. You say, well, if you believe in something bigger, you can't have these problems. The reason why we be believe in something bigger is because we do have these problems. There's got to be something better out there. And to me, that something better makes all this worth it. Yeah, absolutely. We all, uh, where can we find y'all if we want to listen to you or follow you on social media? And I just got an email from uh, from a Travis Creasy. So apparently I'm going to be on a place called Steam Yard. I've never heard of that. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, BenandTravis.com is the easiest way. Uh, it's got everything there from mental health blogs uh, that Ben most excellently writes. Uh, we obviously both of us are, are ministers. And so we've got, we would love for you to use those as bulletin articles. Just put benandtravis.com at the bottom. Give us a little credit. And even if you don't, no big deal. We're not going to come hunt you down like some people I know. Uh, and then, of course, we've got several podcast offerings, The Helping Healing Humor, which will be, you know, featuring the best guests we've ever had in just a few minutes. And then the Friday Refresh and how we probably got up together with the football, the good old-fashioned dislike. But we have a lot of fun, got some a lot of fun videos we put fun at church. I'm still, I still ourselves. want to get the Ben and Travis Batman shirt. That is on my list to get if I can <laughs> ever get one of them. Uh, ben, so Travis and I got on. Was it was it two weeks ago about the draft? 
Yeah. I th- and we were texting each other all night long. My mom was like, who are you texting? I was like, Travis, we're, we're tracking, we're, te- we're, we're testing how many we got right. I think if it wasn't for our trades, we would have gotten everything right. Yeah. yeah. But we were throwing out trades. We're like, people are going to trade, people are going to trade. But luckily, we only did the first five because I would have blown it after number five. <laughs> it was awful. Yeah. yeah. Did y'all get the Falcons pick right? No. No, 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 no. <laughs> we didn't go past five. You guys um, are smart. <laughs> no, golly. I would not have picked I would have not have picked him. I, I was like, y'all paid $180 million to Kirk Cousins, and now you're getting his replacement who's 24 years old. Mm-mm. That's Mm-mm. crazy. If he was 20. Yeah, but I've gotten him in the second round. Yeah. I got that. I get that. Several but of those guys I could have gotten in the second round. I don't know. It was nuts. And I still think the kid from Latham from Alabama, the Titans get was a good what got was a good pick. That's all I could say yeah. about that. Yeah. Well, I do appreciate it. Uh I would like to have y'all back on when we could talk about happier things like ice cream and um and and football. We can talk about we talk about ice cream. You like ice cream, Ben? I like both of the things you just mentioned. So you know, I know Travis doesn't like ice cream, so he'll have to be out of that. <laughs> Come on. Come on now. Love ice cream, especially oh, yeah. if I had some earlier. Oh, oh. It's getting to that time of year, fellas, where it's the uh homemade ice cream that you can just swim in and, and regret the next couple of days, but it's worth it during that time. For sure. Hey, and uh May, May Travis, it looks like the uh the NCAA football is gonna be on pre sale. Let's go. Let's do it. Sign me up. All right. Thank you all for listening to the Footballs Family Podcast.